Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much. You're such an awesome God. and You're so worthy of our praise. Father, you've been with us all day. You've kept us all day long. And even now, Father, we know that you're with us. I pray that you would bless every person who is on, who will even look at this later. I pray that you would bless them, refresh them. Father, many of them have had long and trying days, but Father, I pray that you will refresh their bodies, minds, and spirits so that they will be able to receive what it is that you have for them tonight. Father, we uh, thank you for this privilege and this opportunity to be able to share in the word tonight. We pray that in all of our getting, we would get understanding and that with that understanding, we become better instruments and vessels for you and live in a way that brings you the most glory. Father, bless the word and the hearers of the word. Bless me as I convey it tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all right, all right. So, hey, first lady. All right, so tonight, um, we're going to talk about why I participate in a corporate fast. And so, um, I want to give you uh, some, some nuggets, some things to think about. Um, as it relates to a corporate fast and what is the importance of it? Why should we do it? Why is it beneficial to those who will participate? Um, so first of all, uh, let's just kind of give a, a working definition of fasting in general. Um, and fasting is essentially abstaining from food or something else uh, in order uh, to devote oneself uh, to God and to heighten one's spiritual awareness uh, and spiritual sensitivity. And so we it's a way of denying our flesh. Uh, our flesh, scripture teaches us, is uh, enmity or at odds, or in a battle uh, with our spirit man. Uh, they don't agree. They don't get along. And so we have to do things to intentionally bring our flesh under subjection to the spirit. And so fasting is one of the spiritual disciplines that you see uh, from the old all the way to the New Testament. Uh, even Jesus fasted. You'll see him in the wilderness. Again, we kind of talked about this during Lenten season. The Lenten season is modeled after the 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness. And in that time that he was in the wilderness, we know that he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, denying the flesh in order to feed the spirit, in order to build the spirit. Um, and so uh, we've heard uh, things such as and statements such as uh, whatever you feed the most is going to be the strongest. And and uh, that's true um, as it relates to our spirit and our flesh. Whatever you feed the most is going to be. So the question is, what are you feeding? Who Who's getting uh, the bulk of the diet? Is it your spirit, man? Or is it your flesh? But uh, in particular, fasting is a way of, and I want to, uh, use this word that I may use several times throughout the night. Uh, can somebody put in the comments intentionality? Intentionality. That's an important component and an important mindset as it relates to fasting. It's the intentional aspect of it. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm denying myself intentionally. I'm uh, denying my flesh and, and giving up things that I like, things that I enjoy, things that uh, feed my flesh intentionally because I'm trying to get God's intention, uh, attention on purpose. So my intention is so that I can get God's attention and I'm doing both of them on purpose. So intentionality is important as it relates to the mindset behind fasting. Uh, 
Now, uh, so we got fasting, um, and then we have prayer. Fasting and prayer go hand in hand. Somebody put that in the comments because that's important. Fasting and prayer go hand in hand. Um, prayer is one of the weapons in our arsenal that God gives us uh, to engage in the spiritual realm. And fasting and prayer go together. Anytime in scripture where you see a people or a person fasting, they are also praying. They're not just not eating. They're not just not doing something. Fasting and prayer go together. And can I say here parenthetically, this is important. Uh, and we thank God that we have an awesome intercessory prayer team. Several of them are online tonight. But I need the church to understand this. The intercessory prayer team has not been put in place so that we don't have to pray for ourselves. I really need us to get that. Uh, it's not like, well, why am I praying? We got an intercessory prayer team, don't we? <laughs> well, I don't have anything to do with you. Jesus said, men, people, should always pray, not just the intercessory prayer team, not just the ones who have taken on a special assignment to intercede for others, but you got to be a prayer yourself. Don't just leave it up to the intercessory prayer team and, and while they're praying, you know, you just going on and you like, well, they got me. No, 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 no. Uh, we thank God for them. But each of us has to have a personal prayer life and has to develop the discipline of prayer. So fasting and prayer go hand in hand. So while you're fasting, make sure that you are praying. OK, so why I participate in a corporate fast, though, because I can fast uh, by myself. Yes, you can. And yes, you should. Uh, but why participate in a corporate fast? All right, let's talk about it. So, uh, number one, for my note takers, it encourages others to a new level of spiritual discipline. It encourages others to a new level of spiritual discipline. What am I talking about? There are those who will participate in a corporate fast who may never have considered fasting as an individual, but they'll participate in a corporate fast. Um, so it encourages others to a new level of spiritual discipline. Uh, it's somewhat like a workout partner, and some of you have those, or, or doing a diet with a friend. Uh, it, it's, it's hard by yourself, and it's not necessarily easy with a partner, but it's easier when you know that someone else is doing it with you. Someone else is making the sacrifice with you. Someone else is intentionally denying themselves with you. You're just not the only one. You're not doing it by yourself. You're not out here by yourself, but there is a team. There is a group. There is a whole collection of people who are doing this. So one benefit of a corporate fast is it encourages others to a new level of spiritual discipline. Uh, the next thing, uh, note takers, it exponentially increases effectiveness. That's really important. It exponentially increases effectiveness. We, we can uh, be much more effective as a body and as a whole than we can by ourselves. Uh, Matthew 18 Verses 19 and 20. 
want to read it in the Amplified. Matthew 18, verses 19 and 20 says, Again, I say to you that if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind in harmony about anything they ask within the will of God, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, meeting together as my followers, I am there among them. So this scripture is talking about two or three. Well, what about 200? If two or three can get this done, what about 150? You see, you see my point? So it exponentially increases the effectiveness. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. I'm going to read them from the New Living Translation. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. It says, two people are better than one, for they can help each other succeed. That's why corporate fasts are important, because we're helping each other succeed. Somebody put in the comments, I need your help. Come on, tell them, I need your help. Uh, verse 10, if one person falls, the other can reach out and help, but someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? Verse 12, a person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So you see you see this pattern here. It says two people are better than one. All right. So that's some simple math. Two better than one. If you were in math class, you know how they had us make the greater or less than sign. Two, the, the opening of that greater sign would be to the twos, greater than one. But look, when you get to verse 12 towards the end, and it says, and three is even better than two. So if you follow the logic, four is even better than three. Five is even better than four. Ten is even better than five. Fifty is even better than ten. A hundred is even better than fifty. So... We exponentially increase our effectiveness when we come together and we do it corporately, do it collectively, do it collaboratively. So we exponentially increase the effectiveness. Next thing for the note takers, why participate in a corporate fast? If there is an expectation of hearing from God. That's why you would want to participate in a corporate fast. Uh, if there's an expectation of hearing from God. Second Chronicles chapter 20 verses 1 through 4 in the New Living Translation says, After this the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Menunites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came. And told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazan Tamar. This was another name for in Jedi. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. Everybody began fasting. Verse 4. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. So, they needed the Lord's help. They needed to hear from God. So, a fast was proclaimed. Now, apparently, there had been a precedent set that if you want to hear from God and you're really desperate to hear from God and you need direction right away and in a very urgent way, then it is incumbent upon us to do something special so that we can hear from God especially. So the reason fasting is important, well, we'll get to that. I don't want to give that away. But 
we have to do something in order for God to do something sometimes. So uh, there was an expectation to hear from God. And so a fast was proclaimed for the purpose of hearing from God. Now, another reason you would want to participate in a corporate fast, even in a personal fast, is this next thing, note takers. It enhances your spiritual sensitivity and awareness. Enhances spiritual sensitivity and awareness. It enhances spiritual sensitivity and awareness. When you have, here's that word again, when you have intentionally postured yourself and placed yourself in a position to hear from God, God will honor what you've done in order to do that. And so he will increase your spiritual sensitivity and awareness because you're showing that you are intentional and that you are doing what it takes to hear from him. And God never honors an act of faith. I mean, God never ignores rather an act of faith, but he always honors our acts of faith. And he lets us see the fruit of our faith by responding favorably. So one reason I need to fast is because I need to hear from God. And if I need to hear from God, then I need to enhance my spiritual sensitivity and awareness. Next reason, uh, note takers, that I want to participate in a corporate fast is this next thing. It exhibits a level of serious commitment. It exhibits a level of serious commitment because you you can ask God for this and that and say, Lord, I need you. I need you. And sometimes God is saying, OK, I hear you. But what are you willing to do? Yeah, I, I, I been knew you needed that. I knew I, I knew you needed that all along. But what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? To get what you're saying you need from me. So it exhibits a level of serious commitment. Uh, Joel 2 uh, verses 12 through 17. New Living, Translation, New Living Translation says. That is why the Lord says turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in your grief but tear your hearts instead so part of the grieving and the the showing repentance and sorrow was not only fasting but you would uh tear your garments and you would cover yourself with ash uh that was a part of it but but joel is saying don't just tear your clothes tear your heart uh it, it speaks to what the scripture says about a broken and a contrite heart is what God loves. And so uh, sometimes God says, I know you're serious when you will allow yourself to be broken in spirit and you have a contrite heart and you uh, show a level of sincerity and seriousness that I can respect. He said, I can do something with that. I can work with that when you're serious, when you're sincere, when you show that you are ready by showing what you're willing to do to get what I have for you. Um, verse uh, 15, if you go st still in Joel 2, uh, gather all the people. No, it's 16. 15 says, blow the ram's horn in Jerusalem. Announce a time of fasting. Call the people together for a solemn meeting. So again, this idea of corporate fasting and everybody doing it together is not a novel idea, is not a new idea. Uh, it's something that the people of God have employed since the beginning of them being God's people in order to get God's attention, in order to hear from God, in order 
to have a move in and on their behalf. Uh, it says, uh, gather all the people, the elders, the children, even the babies. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. Listen, I want to say something here parenthetically. Notice verse 16 says, gather the people, the elders, the children, and even the babies. Listen, I, I know that that's a, a tall ask for, for kids, but 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 let them do something. Let let them let them uh, try it for one hour a day. If you're doing twelve hours, let them try it one hour. Where for one hour, they're not on the tablet. For one hour, they're not eating junk food. For one hour, uh, they're denying their flesh. They're not on TikTok. For one hour, uh, they're not. And, and what it does, it it helps them in baby steps develop a discipline, a, this spiritual discipline, so that when they get older, it's not foreign to them. Because some of us can testify, I never had anybody encourage me to fast until I was 30, 40, 50 years old. And so if you have children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews, let them start with a baby step. Let them give up something. Let them give up the tablet. Let them give up the, the iPod or the iPhone and and, and and chips and cookies or something for an hour just to get them started, just to get them started and uh, uh, familiar with the discipline. So I just want to say that because I saw that children and babies. All right. Call the bridegroom from his quarters and the bride from her private room. Let the priest who minister in the Lord's presence stand and weep before the entry room to the temple and the altar. Let them pray. Spare your people, Lord. Don't let your special possession become an object of mockery. Don't let them become a joke for unbelieving foreigners who say, has the God of Israel left them? Then, of course, everybody knows Second Chronicles 7 and 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then, now notice there's an if and a then. There, It starts with if in verse 14, and then we have a then. Then I will hear from heaven. Okay, you want you want to hear from heaven? What are you going to do? I will forgive their sins. You want your sins forgiven? Okay, I ain't got no problem with that. But what are you willing to do? And heal their land. We all want the land, especially right now in this pandemic season and COVID and uh, not just COVID, but all kinds of things going on. And racism and uh, bigotry and injustice and all kinds of things, uh, economy in disarray. Uh, we want the land healed. And God says, I ain't got no problem with handling my then, but but are you willing to do the if? It says, if my people. So uh, there, there is something that we can do to show and exhibit a level of serious commitment. Now, the next thing, and the next reason we ought to want to participate, we're coming into the home stretch here, uh, eliminates distractions and interferences. That's why we ought to want to participate in this corporate fast. It eliminates distractions and interferences. What does that? Because remember, uh, Fasting is, is, is multifaceted. It's abstaining from food. It's abstaining from fleshly desires. But, but there's an overall sense of consecration uh, and, and sanctification uh, that comes with fasting, if it's done in the right spirit and in the proper way. Um, you ought not be not eating chicken but then you, you keep cussing and fighting and, and gossiping and uh, stealing and whatever else. So if, if that's what you're going to do, you, you might as well go and eat whatever you want to eat. <laughs> if all you're going to do is, is, is stop eating ribs and stop eating chocolate, but you're not changing your behavior and intentionally you know, not doing some of the things you know you shouldn't do. 
you know, it, it's not just good enough to, to stop eating. You, you got to stop eating whatever you're going to stop eating. But then your, your mind needs to change. Your spirit needs to change. Your behavior, your speech needs to change. So if, if you are, if you're not eating from 12 to 12, but you cussing every 30 minutes, I mean, I, I mean, is this really helping? I mean, is it really doing anything? So <laughs> it's got to be a combination of things. Uh, and that's why a lot of people don't do it. Because they figure, oh, this is too much. Uh, but you can do it with the Lord's help. It's, it's about intentionality and about asking the Holy Spirit, help me do what I need to do in this moment so I can consecrate myself, sanctify myself. All right, so. But when you consecrate yourself, uh, it eliminates distractions and interferences. Hebrews 12, chapter uh, 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so a great cloud of witnesses who by faith have testified to the truth of God's absolute faithfulness. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, stripping off every unnecessary weight and catches and the sin which so easily and cleverly entangles us. That word has become popular lately, the whole entanglement. We're not going to deal with that tonight. That ain't what our lesson is about. But the point is, sin is a distraction. It, it, it gets you off course. It gets in the way. Um, so you got to strip off the weight and the sin. Here's the thing though. There is a responsibility on me to do that. I got to strip it off. I can't just expect God to do it for me and I have not put forth any effort to strip it off myself. So that's, that's a responsibility that I have to be intentional about stripping off the weights, the sins, the distractions. And let us run with endurance and active persistence the race that is set before us. Here we go again, talking about distractions, interferences. Looking away. I'm in verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 12 in the Amplified. Listen to what verse 2 says. Looking away from all that will distract us. And focusing our eyes on Jesus. When you are fasting, focus on Jesus. Focus on his glory. Focus on his goodness. Focus on his ability. Look away from that stuff that distracts. That's why you can't watch everything while you're fasting. That's why you can't listen to everything while you're fasting. That's why you can't go to some people's houses because you already know how they get down. You already know how they talk. You're going to be over there five minutes and they're going to be in some type of messy conversation that is going to totally mess up your whole fasting vibe. So you got to avoid the distractions. Focus on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of our faith, the first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity. Um, Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Very early in the morning. This is uh, Mark 1 35 in the NIV. Very early in the morning. While it was still dark. Jesus got up. Left the house. And went off to a solitary place. Where he prayed. Now. It said that he did it. Early in the morning, which means, ladies and gentlemen, that he was intentional about starting his day in this manner. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, before everybody got up, before the hustle and bustle of having to get ready for work, before the grind and the and the all the back and forth of having to get kids ready to get on for the virtual learning and get them dressed and comb their hair and brush their teeth. Before all of that, he said, I'm going to get up early and I'm going to find me a place of solitude where there are no distractions. That was the point. 
the, a place of solitude is to eliminate distractions. So he went to a place of solitude while it was still early before the day really got going. And he prayed there. I want to encourage you as you continue to fast, and not just this fast, but any fast that you uh, may find yourself doing or are led to do. Do what you can to avoid the distractions because let me tell you, the devil is not happy because you decided to participate in a fast. So he's going to do everything he can to distract you, to deter you, to get you off your square, to pull you away from your focus and from your uh, intention. Uh, so you got to be careful. You got to be careful because uh, he's tricky and uh, he's not excited about you uh, doing this and being a part of this. Now, uh, another reason you ought to want to uh, participate in this corporate fast is because it has a way of exorcising and not not jumping jack exercising, but exorcising, E-X-O-R-C-I-S-E, or expelling demonic activity. Exercising or expelling demonic activity. Uh, Matthew 17, verses 16 through 21. I'm going to read it in the Amplified. The man says, I brought my son to your disciples. They were not able to heal him. And Jesus answered, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. Verse 18, Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was healed at once. Verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and asked, why couldn't we drive him out? He answered, because of your little faith, your lack of trust and confidence in the power of God. For I assure you and most solemnly say to you, if you have living faith, the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there. And if it's God will, it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Now, here's verse 21. But this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. There is some demonic activity that you need expelled. You need it exercised. And some of that stuff ain't going nowhere until you fast and pray. It exercises or expels demonic activity. And here's the thing about demonic activity. Sometimes you don't even realize it's demonic activity. But there's something that is going on under the surface in the spirit realm that the devil is doing. But we are able, when we fast and when we pray, to tap into another level of spiritual authority and power that allows certain demons that, that are stubborn and resistant. Some of this stuff you got to fast and pray out. Amen. Amen. So whenever you whenever you see, especially when you know it to be so, and when you see it to be clear demonic activity, that's a time where you, the pastor shouldn't have to call a fast. You shouldn't have to uh, be encouraged to fast. You got to know that's the time for me to fast. No, I see. This is demonic activity. The devil is working. I need to fast and pray right now. If somebody fasts with me, great. But even if I got to do it myself, I'm about to do this fast. I'm about to do this prayer because some of this stuff ain't going to go away unless I fast it and I pray it away. Amen. So, um, it exercises or expels demonic activity. And finally, the reason you ought to want to participate in the fast, in a corporate fast, is because we experience better results. That's good. And, and I, don't, I don't know anybody who doesn't want better results. Not anybody in their right mind. Because um, if you don't want better results, you might need an exorcism yourself. <laughs> because if, but anybody in their right mind 
wants better results. So uh, experience better results. That's the last thing, Matthew 17 and 21. And I'm going to use the last verse of the last uh, passage we just used. Remember in verse 21, Jesus said, but this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Somebody say better results. Better results. In other words, that means that in order to get some level of results, you got to fast, you got to pray. It's not impossible to get good results without fasting. It's not impossible. Matter of fact, most of us have been getting decent results and good results without fasting. At, at some times, the grace of God is so wonderful, he'll even give you wonderful and fabulous results and you didn't fast. But according to the principle set forth here, it suggests that we can experience better results. Even if you've gotten good results, you can experience better better results by fasting and by praying. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 in the New International Version. Now, I'm not reading this for the, for the reason you might think, but all of it is good. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 in the NIV. And it says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put on, uh, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. Now, all of that is important. And we've talked about that kind of already about when you're fasting, you shouldn't be trying to disfigure your face and looking all ashy and, and like you busted and disgusted. So somebody can ask, oh, what's wrong? And then you say, oh, nothing. I'm just fasting. No, Jesus said, if you do that, that's, that's, that's your reward that you wanted somebody to know. Now they know. And, it, and your fast ain't going no further than that. So, but that's not my point of reading this uh, passage. This is what I wanted to get to. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Don't miss that. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What's the point? Apparently, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus says that when you fast, there's a reward for it. You, you see it right there. It's right there in the text. Your father who sees what is done. Well, what is that referring to? This whole passage that I just read was talking about fasting. Right? So the what is done in secret is referring back to the fasting. So if I was fasting in secret, he says he'll reward you. The point is he'll reward you. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, it's a worthwhile endeavor. It's a worthwhile undertaking. You're not doing it for nothing. You're not doing it uh, just to participate in a group project. You're not doing it just to uh, have some claim of spiritual elitism, but God is ready to reward us. And I don't know about you, but 2020 has been a, a, a interesting kind of year. And I wouldn't mind a reward right through here. Anybody else besides me could use a reward right through here. He says, I'm not going to let you, when you fast and you pray with the right spirit, and you're not doing it just to be seen. You're not doing it just so everybody knows that you're fasting and, and looking all, uh, you know. He says that I will reward you. 
And the enemy wants to convince us that it's not worth it. Y'all doing that for nothing. Look at y'all going around all hungry, going around with stomach pains and hunger pains. And, and God ain't going to do nothing. He just, the devil is a lie. The, Matthew 6 just told me that if I do it right, and if I do it in the right spirit, there's a reward coming. Can you encourage your neighbor in the comments? Tell him you got a reward coming. Oh, I, you better believe that thing. You got a reward coming. You Because you sacrifice, you got a reward coming. Because you deny yourself, you got a reward coming. Because you uh, put away the distractions and you put away sin and you have consecrated yourself, you've got a reward coming. You've got a reward. I can't wait. I don't know what it's going to be, but I can't wait for my reward. Reward. And I just believe that what my reward is, is going to be worth everything that I deny, everything I put aside, everything that I sacrificed. Hallelujah. You got a reward coming. And so that's why we are participating in this corporate fast. And listen, there will be times in your life that God is going to lead you to fast on your own, fast for your family, fast for a loved one, fast for a friend, fast for yourself. And I want you to know that whenever you're led to fast, it's never for nothing. But ultimately, God wants to reward you. So I want you to tonight go through the rest of this night, through the rest of this week, through the rest of this season, with that assurance and with that confidence that this is not for nothing, but that I have a reward coming. Anybody glad about that? Hallelujah. Thank God for the reward that is coming. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you are, here's that word again, a rewarder. That's what your word says. You are a rewarder of them who diligently seek you. And that's what we're doing right now. That's what the fast is all about. About diligently seeking you. And your word says that what we do in secret, you will reward. Thank you for being a promise keeper. So we're not sad about it. We're not discouraged about it. We're standing and sitting and waiting with tiptoe anticipation for the reward that's coming at the end. Father, I pray for every person who is uh, participating, everyone who is engaging in this self-denial, this crucifying of flesh in order to feed the spirit and to increase spiritual sensitivity and awareness. I pray in the name of Jesus that you would hold them up, strengthen them for the journey. I pray that you would not allow them to be deterred by demonic distractions, but help them to keep their focus and their eyes on you. Father, we pray right now for those members of our family who are experiencing bereavement right now in their families. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would give them your peace. We pray, Father, for those who are struggling, who are having a hard time holding on, holding up. Father, I pray that you would renew their strength like the eagle. Father, I pray for everyone who's having financial hardship. Thank you that you're still Jehovah Jireh and you provide according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that you would not allow them to give up on you because you absolutely have not given up on them. I pray for anybody who is confused and lacking peace and discernment and direction. 
I pray that you would give it to them. Father, you said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added. So, Father, we thank you that you're adding. Thank you that you're giving what is needed. Father, I pray that you would call someone who has not been sleeping well. Give them a sweet rest tonight. Knowing that whatever they're going through, whatever they need, you've got it under control. Father, bless us. Now seal this word in our hearts and in our minds. Don't let the enemy take it away. Father, we bless you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, good peoples. Uh, thank you for coming on. If you've been blessed by this, if you wouldn't mind sharing this, and we're looking forward to seeing you real soon. God bless.